Please welcome to the stage, Sebastian Bazin, Chairman and CEO of Accor, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Malika Kapoor. Sebastian, it's great to have you with us. Thank you for being here. It's nice of me to be just right behind Tony. It's <laughs> Better that way than the other way. Better that yeah. way, right? We planned it because we knew you I've were coming here. <laughs> Excellent. Right, before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to remind all of you here that we want this to be interactive. So do send in your questions and a reminder that you have a QR code at the back of your badge. So you can scan that and that will allow you to send us uh, your questions. So please do that. Sebastian, you know, we are seeing a rebound in travel, but there are challenges. Inflation is a real concern now, and people are starting to think twice about how they spend their money. Yeah. Are you concerned that this dent in consumer confidence could affect travel plans? You know what? I'm concerned about many things, but let me enjoy the time being. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting for traffic to be back for two years. We have it. So yeah. until you tell me it's going to be gloomy, <laughs> For the time being, it is rosy. It is fine. We have now it's, uh, but I have my eyes wide open. Of course, we have inflation, uh, yeah. both on labor and on energy pricing, and of course on supply, food and others. So, it is difficult to cope with. However, we have quite one great luck is, and Tony mentioned it. Mm -hmm. So far, for the hotel owners, we have the ability to pass through the entire inflation with a higher price per room. So the margin of the hotel owners are sustained mm -hmm. because of the ability to uplift pricing. How long that's going to last? Probably not that long, mm -hmm. but I need to say, I need to tell every hotel owner on this planet, I need them to sustain margin, I actually need them to have better margin, because we've been on our knees for two and a half years. Correct. We've yeah. been going through hell. It has been difficult. We've been coping with a lot of uh, tens of thousands of employees to make sure they were safe. So let's enjoy the tailwind. It is yes. there. Let's service the customers at best. And I'll worry about inflation a bit later. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, international travel, international business travelers, you know, we're still not at the level we were before the pandemic. So how are you making up for that shortfall? How are your hotels, you know, uh, pivoting perhaps to catering for a more local? There's two things you do, which is, uh, Again, a blessing, and I hope I'm not the only one. COVID has been really tough, but I think we come out personally and professionally as being a different person. Yeah. We had time to reflect. We had time to change a lot of wrong habits, norms, standards for the last 50 years. We didn't have time to think. So for us and for our core, there's two things happening now. Number one, and again, Tony mentioned it, you don't know how big is the leisure travel. The numbers of people who really want to regain control of their life, to enjoy meeting other people, uh, and basically discover new places, it is probably twice faster than it's ever been pre-pandemic. And huh. interesting enough, those people go between two and three hours away from their home. They don't go five hours away, and they go by train, they go by car, and they visit places next to their home that never thought about visiting before. And they right. go, it's true, they go on Thursday night, they come back on Tuesday morning because they have the ability to work remotely on, Thursday, on Friday and on Monday from the yeah. hotel. So that business is very strong. The, the domestic travel, the business domestic is also back. And it's back because people need to rebound together, they need to see colleagues of there, and they need to reconquest different clients. The one thing to be worried about, and I've been saying it a long time ago, two years ago, international business travel cross-continent, a person coming from Seattle to Paris or Paris to Singapore, yeah, I really believe 25% of that business is lost forever. Forever. Well, it's lost yeah. forever because of what we're doing uh, with Tony and others, because Zoom, WebEx, team, it actually yeah. works and it's very efficient. Mm -hmm. And it is a costly travel and it is tiresome. So a lot of CEOs, CFOs of large corporations will ask their colleagues to stay and to do the first meeting by Zoom. That's okay, I just, yeah. because it's okay, because for the same, Amelika, sorry to be so, so long, for the same cause, which is the digital tool, which may stand for me to lose 25% of that international business travel, 
it has another side, which is an enormous benefit. It, that ability to work remotely because of those digital tools makes it happen that I guess people are mixing to their leisure and business. Pleasure. And, and business they go and, and they go and work from a hotel. And the one thing I'm looking forward to really get is pivoting. We, yeah. We've been foolish in the hotel industry for so long. There is 7.5 billion people living on this planet. 1.5 billion travel, hmm. which is great. So, of course, we cope with 1.5 billion, but there's 6 billion people who do not travel. Yeah. And we've done nothing for them. It's about time we wake up. We have big hotels in the centers of wonderful cities for which owners paid hundreds of millions. Let's open the doors, the gate, the bar, the restaurant to the local community. Local community, yes. And exactly. that is a huge yeah. transformation for the hotel industry. And we can cope and we can do it. Another massive transformation, of course, has been uh, digitization. Now, I went on a trip earlier this year, leisure travel, and I will admit I did not stay in one of your hotels, but when I, you know, I booked the hotel uh, online, yeah. I checked in before or through my phone before I got to the hotel, I was told to use my um, phone as a key. I booked, uh, you know, room service through an app, checked out through an app, I did not see a human. Is that the future of hospitality? That is so nice. You said it was not my never. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> because it would never happen if you were at an alcohol hotel. Well, it's I'm never, glad I'm, to hear I'm that. I'm going to stop you before you get into the room when you enter the hotel. No, but it's, it's, because it's, I miss that. I want the, Malika, you know, hello and welcome. Malika, it's schizophrenic for me. It's, uh, I know I need to accept digital technology, seamless process, you accessing your room because you don't want to waste any time. So it, it's kind of a must, but I hate it. Mm. I hate it because I don't want to transform the hotel industry as a motel industry. I want to spend five minutes with you. I want to know you. I want to care for you. I want to tell you, why don't you go to next door museum because there's an exhibition. I need to be your guide. I need to be your eyes for you to discover that city in which you are. Otherwise, nobody's going to guide you. So that equilibrium between a digital tool and human touch I decided not to go for any tech companies, one, because I understand nothing about tech, <laughs> but two, because I don't like it. Hospitality exactly the reverse. It's a human capital, warm industry. Yeah. And that's what makes us so different. Not better, but just different. Very true. I want to talk to you quickly about Russia. Some of your competitors have pulled out. Yeah. You decided to stay. Why? Well, it's a, it's a very difficult question. It's first, we being the first company 120 days ago, to stop any development in, in Russia, to stop any opening in Russia, in Russia, to stop any alcohol leave limited loyalty partnership, to of course stop any management operation with any sanctioned people in terms of ownership. We have 60 hotels in Russia and 4,000 people. I am with being helping Ukraine, you don't know even how. I've been actually, I went myself to the frontier of Russia, Ukraine. We have also 700 people in Ukraine. We provided mm -hmm. a couple hundred thousand room nights. We gave jobs to all the Ukrainians who left and, and spending a lot of time with Ukraine. I'm, I'm just trying to pose and to say that there is vast difference between Kremlin and the Russian population. I'm trying to be a caretaker for those 4,000 people. Mm -hmm. This is not the best answer. Every day we rethink what we should be doing but we have legal contract obligation with non-sanctioned hotel owners. And if I were to close, they will run the hotel anyhow. Correct. So it's, okay. uh, there's no, I'm telling you, humanly, there's no great solutions. I am 100% behind Ukraine, but clearly we haven't made that decision as of yet. He would not change anything in terms of people probably staying at the hotel. We don't make any money out of Russia, zero. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But it's, uh, there's one thing I'm so proud about Accor, it's been in existence for over 50 years. Yeah. And we've been going through a lot of different conflict, war zone in many different regions, sub-South Africa and South America. Accor never left the country in the times of debacle, never ever, because we decided to stay. And most of the hotels, you know, are occupied by NGOs by government officials moving and trying to help resolve situations. Journalists. You need journalists. You need those hotels to basically be open for people to basically be witnesses. So yeah. again, it's, uh, I, I may reconsider that decision. 
It's a tough decision to make. It's a tricky place to be. Now, I did ask the audience to send in questions, and we do have a great question, so let's turn to that. Would Accor establish a sustainable hotel property in Qatar, maybe in a sustainable area, such as within the Qatar free zone? Now, you do have a property opening here in a few months. How eco-friendly is it? Well, uh, I've been coming to this country since 1991. Mm and probably over a couple hundred times. So I'm a very good friend of this country, and I love this country and the people mm -hmm. of this country. So yes, are we going to be doing sustainable in Qatar? We already started. Everything we do in this country has to be done in terms of protecting the workforce, protecting biodiversity. We're doing everything we can, and we made so much progress over the last 10 years now. And the new Qatar Towers properties responses to all of this, and it's going to be an iconic building. So. Yes, I, uh, I want that country to grow faster, and I want our core to be part of it. Uh, we can do now carbon-free emission new hotels. You just have to understand there's a 20% additional cost of materials to make it carbon-free from scratch. Uh, mm -hmm. But okay, that's another. We can talk about it for a couple of hours. Yes, we can. Absolutely. We'll come back for that conversation. Thank you so much for being with that's us, it. Sebastian. Unfortunately, well, that was, that's it. Look at the clock. That was quick. I know, right? <laughs> I'm going to go complain to the organizers. <laughs> yeah, no, don't. Thank you so right. much. Monica. Thank you very much. Thanks. And next up, we have my colleague Stephen Engel in conversation with the CEO of Trip.com, Jane Sun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.